Welcome to Chapter 7, The Cellular Basis of Inheritance. In this chapter, we will cover a brief overview of sexual reproduction, meiosis, and errors in meiosis. Introduction. The ability to reproduce in kind is a basic characteristic of all living things. In kind means that the offspring of any organism closely resembles its parent or parents. Hippopotamuses give birth to hippopotamus calves. Monterey pine trees produce seeds from which Monterey pine seedlings emerge. And adult flamingos lay eggs that hatch into flamingo chicks. In kind does not generally mean exactly the same. While many single-celled organisms and a few multicellular organisms can produce genetically identical clones of themselves through mitotic cell division, many single-celled organisms and most multicellular organisms reproduce regularly using another method. Sexual reproduction is the production by parents of haploid cells and the fusion of a haploid cell from each parent to form a single, unique, diploid cell. In multicellular organisms, the new diploid cell will then undergo mitotic cell divisions to develop into an adult organism. A type of cell division called meiosis leads to the haploid cells that are part of the sexual reproductive cycle. Sexual reproduction, specifically meiosis and fertilization, introduces variation into offspring that may account for the evolutionary success of sexual reproduction. The vast majority of eukaryotic organisms can or must employ some form of meiosis and fertilization to reproduce. Section 1, Sexual Reproduction. By the end of this section, you will be able to explain that variation among offspring is a potential evolutionary advantage resulting from sexual reproduction. Describe the three different life cycle strategies among sexual multicellular organisms and their commonalities. Sexual reproduction was an early evolutionary innovation after the appearance of eukaryotic cells. The fact that most eukaryotes reproduce sexually is evidence of its evolutionary success. In many animals, it is the only mode of reproduction. And yet, scientists recognize some real disadvantages to sexual reproduction. On the surface, offspring that are genetically identical to the parent may appear to be more advantageous. If the parent organism is successfully occupying a habitat, offspring with the same traits would be similarly successful. There is also the obvious benefit to an organism that can produce offspring by asexual budding, uh, fragmentation, or asexual eggs. These methods of reproduction do not require another organism of the opposite sex. There is no need to expend energy finding or attracting a mate that energy can be spent on producing more offspring. Indeed, some organisms that lead a solitary lifestyle have retained the ability to reproduce asexually. In addition, asexual populations only have female individuals, so every individual is capable of reproduction. In contrast, the males in a sexual population, so about half the population, are not producing offspring themselves. Because of this, an asexual population can grow twice as fast as a sexual population in theory. This means that in competition, the asexual population would have the advantage. All of these advantages to asexual reproduction, which are also disadvantages to sexual reproduction, should mean that the number of species with asexual reproduction should be more common. However, multicellular organisms that exclusively depend on asexual reproduction are exceedingly rare. Why is sexual reproduction so common? This is one of the important questions in biology and has been the focus of much research from the latter half of the 20th century until now. A likely explanation is that the variation that sexual reproduction creates among offspring is very important to the survival and reproduction of those offspring. The only source of variation in asexual organisms is mutation. This is the ultimate source of variation in sexual organisms. In addition, those different mutations are continually reshuffled from one generation to the next when different parents combine their unique genomes and the genes are mixed into different combinations by the process of meiosis. 
Meiosis is the division of the contents of the nucleus that divides the chromosomes among gametes. Variation is introduced during meiosis as well as when the gametes combine in fertilization. Evolution in action, the Red Queen hypothesis. There is no question that sexual reproduction provides evolutionary advantages to organisms that employ this mechanism to produce offspring. The problematic question is why, even in the face of fairly stable conditions, sexual reproduction persists when it is more difficult and produces fewer offspring for individual organisms. Variation is the outcome of sexual reproduction, but why are ongoing variations necessary? Enter the Red Queen hypothesis, first proposed by Leigh Van Valen in 1973. The concept was named in reference to the Red Queen's race in Lewis Carroll's book, Through the Looking Glass, in which the Red Queen says one must run at full speed just to stay where one is. All species co-evolve with other organisms. For example, uh, predators co-evolve with their prey, and parasites co-evolve with their hosts. A remarkable example of co-evolution between predators and their prey is the unique co-adaption of night-flying bats and their moth prey. Bats find their prey by emitting high-pitched clicks, but moths have evolved simple ears to hear these clicks so that they can avoid the bats. The moths have also adapted behaviors, such as flying away from the bat when they first hear it, or dropping suddenly to the ground when the bat is upon them. Bats have evolved quiet clicks in an attempt to evade the moth's hearing. Some moths have evolved the ability to respond to the bat's clicks with their own clicks as a strategy to confuse the bat's echolocation abilities. Each tiny advantage gained by favorable variation gives a species an edge over close competitors, predators, parasites, or even prey. The only method that will allow a co-evolving species to keep its own share of the resources is also to continually improve its ability to survive and produce offspring. As one species gains an advantage, other species must also develop an advantage or they will be outcompeted. No single species progresses too far ahead because genetic variation among progeny of sexual reproduction provides all species with a mechanism to produce adapted individuals. Species whose individuals cannot keep up become extinct. The Red Queen's catchphrase was, it takes all the running you can do to stay in the same place. This is an apt description of coevolution between competing species. Life cycles of sexually reproducing organisms. Fertilization and meiosis alternate in sexual life cycles. What happens between these two events depends on the organism. The process of meiosis reduces the resulting gametes chromosome number by half. Fertilization, the joining of two haploid gametes, restores the diploid condition. There are three main categories of life cycles in multicellular organisms. Diploid dominant, in which the multicellular diploid stage is the most obvious life stage, and there is no multicellular haploid stage, as with most animals including humans. Haploid dominant, in which the multicellular haploid stage is the most obvious life stage, and there is no multicellular diploid stage, as with all fungi and some algae, and alternation of generations, in which the two stages, haploid and diploid, are apparent to one degree or another depending on the group, as with plants and some algae. Nearly all animals employ a diploid dominant life cycle strategy in which the only haploid cells produced by the organism are the gametes. The gametes are produced from diploid germ cells, a special cell line that only produces gametes. Once the haploid gametes are formed, they lose the ability to divide again. There is no multicellular haploid life stage. Fertilization occurs with the fusion of two gametes, usually from different individuals, restoring the diploid state. And that references the top figure here on this slide. Here is the question that accompanied this figure. If a mutation occurs so that a fungus is no longer able to produce a minus mating type, will it still be able to reproduce? Most fungi and algae employ a life cycle strategy in which the multicellular body of the organism is haploid. 
During sexual reproduction, specialized haploid cells from two individuals join to form a diploid zygote. The zygote immediately undergoes meiosis to form four haploid cells called spores. That's in the bottom figure on this slide. The third life cycle type, employed by some algae and all plants, is called alternation of generations. These species have both haploid and diploid multicellular organisms as part of their life cycle. The haploid multicellular plants are called gametophytes because they produce gametes. Meiosis is not involved in the production of gametes in this case, as the organism that produces gametes is already haploid. Fertilization between the gametes forms a diploid zygote. The zygote will undergo many rounds of mitosis and give rise to a diploid multicellular plant called a sporophyte. Specialized cells of the sporophyte will undergo meiosis and produce haploid spores. The spores will develop into gametophytes. And that is depicted here in this slide. A couple of other uh, fun facts about sexual reproduction in Animalia is one is the phenomena known as penis fencing. It happens amongst marine flatworms where all individuals are hermaphroditic and they engage in a competition in which one tries to pierce the other one with their hemipenes. The one that is able to pierce the other first and inject their gametes uh, will then swim away while the other one will carry the burden of producing the offspring. Now the ability for an animal to reproduce itself is called parthenogenesis. The uh, whiptail lizards in the American Southwest can do it, as can the Daphnia. Essentially, they induce their own self-fertilization. And that brings us to the end of Section 1. Join me next time for Section 2, Meiosis.